work and play as being completely separate things. Right? When you're a kid in school, you have recess and that's fun, and then you go into classroom and that's work. When I was growing up, I had this uh, image on the uh, wall of my parents' house that I got to look at every day. The idea that you work first and you play afterwards. And as we grow up, that continues with us because as adults we have work-life issues and some of us work all the time and some of us play all the time. Neither one of those works quite well. And so what I want to get across today, one of the key messages, is that we need to work and play all the time. We need to play as we work. We need to exploit our play and use that in various ways to improve our world. So. Don't just work first and play afterwards, but play always. Exploit your play and use that to explore your world, not just on the outside, but also on the inside. And specifically, we're going to talk about applying play to our exploration of human health and ways we can use that to make our lives better. So, the general idea is, as kids, we are innately explorers of our universe. And as a species, we've always been an exploratory species. And exploration really is a three-part deal. Okay? If we're going to explore, we need three things. We need a map, a direction, a vision, a way to go out and look at what it is we're exploring, and then some kind of control that will enable us to go out, explore new regions, bring back samples, what have you, and manipulate our environment as we go forward. Something we know as kids, something that we as a species have engaged in throughout history, and something that we need to keep in mind as we explore our inner world as well as our external world. Let's look at a few more examples of this. The direction. Direction is a map. It doesn't necessarily need to be a perfect map. For example, this 1581 map of the world from the Library of Congress, you can see that some of the continents aren't shaped quite right. Some things aren't quite in exactly the right position. But it gives a general overall feel that we can use to go out and explore. And once we have that direction, we can then create extraordinary pieces of technology like the Hubble Space Telescope that allow us to go out and have a vision of our world and bring back phenomenal images like these of the universe that have so inspired all of us. We use that vision and that map to create new technologies as well that allow us to control our environment. Uh, for example, the Mars rover, which is a, a, a device that has enabled us to, in a way, go to Mars and see that Mars, well, is Nevada. Not a value judgment, I'm just saying. <laughs> so vision, direction, and control gives us understanding of our universe and allows us to change our world in ways that are extraordinary. How do we apply that to health? Well, if we think about uh, this exploration that we're going to take in health, it's not going to be like uh, Ernest Shackleton. No one's going to freeze to death. Uh, we don't have to worry about being stuck on an iceberg for months at a time. That's a nice aspect of health. But we have to think about how we take these ideas that we learned as children about exploration and turn that into a way to really understand our inner selves. And let me introduce that in this way. If I think about someone's health at the macroscopic level, someone doing pull-ups, I can say quite a bit about how physically fit they are, about how healthy they are. But I need to move beyond what my eyes can see on the outside at a deeper level, going beyond that macroscopic view, down beneath the skin, down even to the cellular level, to begin to understand how someone's health is progressing. Now, as it turns out, uh, the cellular level of human health is something that we also, as a species, have been studying for hundreds of years. A great example of that is Robert Hooke, who in 1665 published this manuscript 
called Micrographia. It seems like a really grandiose title, but, but in fact, the group of scientists, or natural philosophers, as they were called at the time, a phrase that I still like, uh, were playing. And they were playing with new toys, new to tools that they invited, invented, like the microscope, to see the world in new and extraordinary ways. And so for Hooke, uh, he looked at things that were important to people of his time, for example, the common head louse. If you were in England in 1600s, that was something that was important to you. But he also looked at just interesting things along the way, like cork bark was the first person to really see what the makeup was of cork. And in fact, it's from Robert Hooke that we have the very word cells, because Hooke thought that these individual chambers looked like where you might put monks. I don't know what that says about Hook, but it stuck, okay? So this spirit of play that the natural philosophers had enabled us to see cells. But for us, and as we understand health, we need to go even farther. We need to go to an even smaller arena of size, the molecular level, because we and all around us are really societies of molecules. We are DNA, RNA, and proteins that all interact in complex ways and create the conditions that allow us to have a healthy life or have problems along the way. Let me just give you a few examples of that from the protein realm. Here's uh, something that looks kind of like a, a vicious molecule. I imagine if you were a kid and you had a model of this thing, you might immediately turn it into a gun, right? It's got the shape for it. Uh, and in fact, that's not a bad uh, analogy, because this protein actually is from enteropathogenic E. coli. This is the, the nasty bacterium that you hear about in spoiled meat and spinach and so on. And, and the bacterium actually uses this protein to act like a harpoon attaching itself to human cells. Here's another one. This is a, a protein called hemagglutinin. This is used by the flu virus, something that many of us are unfortunately very familiar with and will become more so as winter goes along. Uh, but this is another protein that the flu virus uses to attach itself to human cells and introduce its DNA into us, infecting us. What about this protein? Well, this happens to be the protein that is one of the critical components of keeping me alive, of keeping my niece and grandnephew alive, all of us alive. This is hemoglobin, a protein that carries oxygen in red blood cells. So understanding all of these different proteins and the other molecules that make up the society of molecules will enable us to know which of these are contributing to our health or detracting from it. Now, how do we do that? How do we take this concept of direction, control, and vision and translate into health? Well, what that will allow us to do, just to preface this briefly, is as we have these maps of different molecules, we create technology that allows us to go out and visualize them and understand how they're interacting. And from that knowledge and from that map, we can create new drugs, new therapies, and improve our health. So first, the map. We we're at the stage now with the Society of Molecules that's sort of like this 1581 map of the world. Some of the continents aren't shaped quite right. Things are not quite in the right place, but we're getting a general idea. And much of that has been through the Human Genome Project, something that has taken place over the last 15 to 20 years, and other sequencing efforts that have allowed us to get to the point where now I can go online and from a publicly available database, pull down a genetic sequence and know that that genetic sequence is from this anthrax rather than this anthrax. <laughs> I don't think they've been sequenced yet. We'll work on that. Or it allows us to look at a map of proteins. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the signaling map for various types of human cancer. You can view this sort of as, as the protein Facebook for cancer in that each one of these different proteins is interacting with other proteins, and those all coordinate to allow us to either function normally or abnormally and end up with cancer. And if you think about what we're going to do with this map, is as we understand all of these connections, 
Each one of those nodes in this connected graph is potentially a target for a new cancer drug. All we have to do is go in and look at it. So how do we navigate this map of the unseeable? How do we see these molecules in their society? Well, that's one of the things that my lab works on particularly, and I'll just show you a couple examples of that. And this takes advantage, again, of some of the things, in many respects, quite literally, that we had as children. This is a, a, a toy workbench that I had as a kid. Many of you may have had these. Uh, you'll notice that the, the hammer is missing. It was probably taken away from me at some point for misuse. Um, I don't know how I retained the wrench, but I couldn't, anyway. Uh, if you're familiar with these, basically it's a matter of putting a peg into a particularly shaped hole. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to create a technology that's a, going to allow us to take that shape of a protein, for example, think about the ones that I showed you, have them come into a particular hole in a device and let us detect that. Or if you want another direct analogy, many times I think that what I actually do is create new ways of making a light bright. Okay? In that I'm going to have these different pegs that go in a particular grid, and instead of making a clown or a boat or what have you, I'm making a light bright for cancer. In that what we want to do is have a device where we can, for example, target, in this case, the immune system, a complex network of interacting proteins, and be able to see that if one place lights up, we have a particular protein. If another one lights up in a sample, say a blood sample that we applied to this chip, we have a different protein. And if two together light up, then we have some mixture of the two. Okay. So it's very simple, and it's literally taken from the toys that we had as kids. Now, the way we do this, actually, is we work with silicon. Silicon is a material that's very easy to manipulate in complex ways, and, and uh, one of the ways that we work with silicon is by using its reflective properties. If I take a silicon wafer, you can see that it's shiny, it's very reflective. Uh, you can see what's outside my window, for example, from the wafer. But what we do is we say, all right, we want to detect small amounts of proteins binding to a specific part on this chip, what we're going to do is we're going to make all that reflectivity go away first. Sort of like the analogy that if I want to see what's going on in a building in a particular office during the daytime, that's really tough. But if I look at night, when it's dark all around and there's just one light in that office, it's easy to pick up. So we create a condition on this silicon chip whereby we have no light coming out if our target is not present. We don't have the protein in our sample and then light comes out on this grid when a protein attaches to it. Okay. The protein light bright. So here's what that looks like. This is the device. It's a relatively simple, not particularly exciting to look at thing, but it's PC sized and you can pick it up and shake it and it still works. Uh, and what the information is that you get out of that is, for example, if I have uh, a chip like the top image, uh, top part of this image, uh, you can see that there are a series of different spots. Those are all different shape-matched molecules that are going to bind another shape-matched molecule that I have as a target. The image at the bottom shows where I've applied a human serum sample, a blood sample, to this chip. You can see that some of those spots have lit up. And since I know where they are in that grid, I know that that corresponds to a certain amount of a protein called interferon gamma, an important protein in the human immune system. Here's another example. Remember the hemagglutinin protein that I showed a little bit earlier? Well, different hemagglutinins correspond to different kinds of influenza. And so we can think about making a chip with all of these different hemagglutinins on it. And depending on the response of that molecular light, right, I can see whether someone's either infected with flu or whether they have immunity to a particular kind of flu quite easily. So for example, what we do is create one of these chips. You don't have to worry about the complexity of this diagram. But when we apply a sample to it, some things light up, some things don't. And that gives us our profile of immune response to those particular hemagglutinin proteins. So for example, mouse plasma, naive immune deficient mice don't have any immunity to flu. They show up as nothing. 
uh, a subject in this particular vaccine trial that uh, had been uh, exposed to a placebo has a little bit of some immunity, some response to two different hemagglutinins. That's because we all have exposure to flu at some point. And other subjects in this vaccine trial pre and post vaccination see a strong increase in the amount of antibodies in their blood present to these particular isoforms, these particular forms of the hemagglutinin protein. So with one chip, I can begin to profile a whole series of subjects in a vaccine trial and know whether the vaccine that I'm working on is going to have effectiveness or not in bringing out immunity to that particular kind of flu. Or alternatively, I can use the same chip, and if a bird falls to the ground outside my house, I can know whether it's got bird flu or not, just based on seeing this immunity coming up. But what if we want to go even further than that? What if we want to detect a single virus? Now that might be important to do because a single virus can cause illness, right? That's all it takes. How do we detect one tiny thing like this 50 nanometer diameter human papillomavirus? Well, for that, we go back to the workbench analogy. And this time, it really is quite literal in that we're going to create a device that is a nanoscale silicon device with tiny holes in it that interact with light in specific ways. And this now is so small that you could put 74,000 of these things on a dime. Okay. We can make these things and use them to capture individual viruses like that human papillomavirus and see that optical, uh, an optical uh, response to that virus capture. So now we have a way to potentially detect things that might harm us down to the single particle level and identify them explicitly using the same ideas that came from our play. So hopefully what I've been able to do in just a short period of time is show you that by incorporating aspects of play, including our hunger for exploration that we learned as children, have done as a species, and carry forward into adulthood, we can begin to explore our inner world as well as our external world with new maps of molecules that interact, this society of molecules, new tools to go out and look at them. And what I haven't been able to tell you about today is the way that we can then use that to develop new ways of controlling this molecular environment through new drugs, new therapeutic strategies, and so on. And just in our lab, what we're doing is using that to develop new therapies for Alzheimer's, AIDS, muscular dystrophy, and others. And hopefully that will all improve our world, our health, and most importantly, the health and well-being of those who come after us. Thank you.